for this particular event is um, sponsored by a brewery, which is something... Not great for somebody with a previous alcohol problem. <laughs> so that's fun. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a very light-hearted festival, as you can see, in its programming. Do you think it was um, deliberate? I think, I think they want to start a conversation, <laughs> which is great, because that's what we're here to do. Before we get stuck into things, uh, can you give us a show of hands? Who has never done yoga? Okay. I, I'm questioning your intentions in coming. <laughs> <laughs> so you, who's, who's tried it a few times? You know, you tipped your tongue in the water, perhaps you did it for a few times, you sort of walked away, you go every now and again, but you're not, you're not. Be honest. Be honest. There we go. And who, who shows up for yoga frequently? Me. Oh. Majority. No pressure. No pressure. Get up here. <laughs> <laughs> um, great. A real mix of experience. Um, Finley, you've got a very unique and personal story of how you come into yoga. You had two rounds of surgery on your legs. Um, the first time you walk into yoga, you're on mobility support. Um, and it took you about five years to be comfortable with the practice. Tell us about how that worked for you. When I started yoga, I just had two rounds of surgery on my legs to have my legs effectively sanded down. I don't recommend that, by the way, if you get a choice. And I went to my first lesson. I arrived 45 minutes early, which tells you a lot about my personality. And when I mentioned to the teacher that I couldn't walk properly or stand up, she just turned and gave me this look. Oh, we're doing standing poses though. And that was the limit of her empathy. So I basically, whenever we were doing standing work in the class, I was just told to sit down and watch. So I stuck around for about eight months before giving up yoga classes and then never really went back to yoga classes. After that, I just started doing my own thing, and that got me back on my feet, and as you can see, onto other parts. <laughs> Behave. It's too early. There's young ones here. <laughs> um, what, what changed? When was the point when um, you found out that there was different sorts of practices and that one didn't and, and for anyone in the room who's wondering, um, how they're going to continue or explore, um, or how do they start? I think when I started, I had a very naive view of what yoga was. The person that was teaching it, I assumed that that was what it was. That one person's view was the overarching assumption of what yoga would encompass. And so, through the discipline of following a teacher, I very much took that on board and took on board the discipline of it. And in that way, it became very harsh. This was the same teacher that, during a twisting pose, came over and said, ah, you can't do that because you're too fat. You should try and stick your fingers down your throat enough that you lose enough weight to be able to get the twist. And that started a track down bulimia, which was not much fun either. But it was legitimized by traditional yoga practice, which is a contentious term at the best of times anyway. But it wasn't until many years later, when I went to a different yoga workshop with my teacher now, Anna Forrest, that I was sitting there. I was already in, I'd already been teaching yoga for about three years, had a yoga studio. And when I sat in her lesson, at the end of her class, I sat there and just thought, what have I been doing for all of these years? Because it's not been there. Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> what I had been doing felt more like punishment. Whereas what I ended up doing there felt more like repair. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's something um, really poignant about um, the way you come into yoga, you develop it, and, and sort of open up this world now for other people, in that your injury became a real gift in the end that you offer to others because of the experience you've been through, you were really empathetic and sensitive and knowledgeable about what it takes to come to yoga class when you're less physically able. Tell us a little bit about that. I think it's something that I say to a lot of the people that I teach to be teachers, is actually that any of the hardships that they've gone through become a, a gift when they become teachers themselves. Mm -hmm. And 
the person that I was learning from first had a very natural physical prowess, and I certainly, I certainly didn't have that at all. And having to learn to adapt for injuries meant obviously that I was able to see the pathways for other people that they could adapt for their own poses. And now, I mean, I work on a weekly basis with children with multiple disabilities. And if you had to sit down with a rigorous class plan of, do this, what do you mean you can't do that? That doesn't work for a child that either can't communicate or can't walk. So learning to adapt is probably one of the best things that can come from a yoga practice, actually. There's this really overarching theme where people think, I can't do this because choose your favorite reason why you think you can't, and I greatly disagree. Um, you know, we talked a lot, a lot about, a little bit about the physical piece, but actually, um, I mean, there's lots of practitioners in the room. Um, yoga practice is so much more than the images we have been consuming online. Um, not your images so much, but um, the images of, of yoga we associated with is incredible. Physicality. I was sitting at breakfast today with a lovely family. I'm staying here, here in Wigtown, and um, she said to me, "Oh, I'd love to do yoga. My back is sore, but um, I, I don't think I'd be able to do the poses." Tell us about what yoga really is, because it's so much more than that. Isn't it? Uh, there's a can of worms. <laughs> <laughs> so just thinking about people coming along with injury. One of the things that I say a lot to people when they come along to class, like I run a class called Yoga for Back Pain. The majority of what I teach is beginner level, but the majority of what I present virtually and in videos is not necessarily anything I would necessarily expect people to jump into a class and do. Even when I teach, I mean, I, I tour and teach all over the world, it's mostly beginner. It's mostly beginner level people that are showing up for classes, not advanced practitioners. You're lucky if I get to teach advanced poses to anybody. Mm. So when people show up with an injury, showing up to a teacher that doesn't know how to adapt, that's problematic because you're relying on their skill set because you may not have that information yet. The only information you have to go on is, is this putting me in pain, is it not? If you've got that information, you can still change the poses. Mm -hmm. But going along to a lead class can be really problematic, especially if you think that all classes are the same. If you've got a back problem and you go to a really dynamic class, that could be quite problematic, when instead, if you went to a slower class that's more therapeutic, that may be better. But if you go to a class with back pain and all they're doing is napping for an hour, you're not going to get rid of the back pain by napping. Those of you that are going to meditate and pain Agreement away. across the audience there. Um, <laughs> Not agreement, some people saying they're like, oh no, that's what I do. <laughs> um, we were chatting beforehand, I was saying that one of the, you know, sort of most complex relationships uh, that I've exerted in my life is about choosing a dentist, a hairdresser, a therapist, and a yoga teacher. Tell us about how do you don't always get it right at the beginning. What have you learned about that? What would you say to people who are kind of towing with it, not, not feeling that if they're really responding to it, how do they go about finding what's right for them? I would say a lot of people that come to me for yoga in Dundee usually come in with a story of some terrible experience that they've had in a yoga classroom where they've either been like pushed over by a teacher or yanked into a pose or the teacher was an airhead like whatever it was, and then they give up on it. They gave it the one try and that was enough. But actually, it's like you say, like I, mean, I remember many terrible dentists just like I remember many terrible yoga teachers. And one of the really good things to remember is that you can walk out. Like I've walked out of so many sessions, so many. You know, my attendance becomes my currency. And in that way, the value. Yeah, an expected moment in this event when we encourage people to walk out. <laughs> okay. If you are not allowed to walk out, you must stay. <laughs> it's different. See, when somebody's paid over five pounds, they stay. <laughs> you paid two pounds for a class? <laughs> um, so, 
So something about following your instinct and what's, what you're responding and learning through. Mm, not necessarily. I think sometimes when people meet a teacher for the first time and then in a learning experience, the learning experience itself can be quite challenging mm -hmm. and they end up up against a lot of their own racket. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of that can get projected onto the teacher and you blame them. It's like, you made my hip sore. Mm? No, it's your hip. So you need to take responsibility. Was that person helping you or were they hindering you? If it's leaning towards helping you, maybe let them help you further. But if you don't instantly have a connection with that person, it may not be, again, it may not be the person that you want to learn from. I mean, I'm terrible. I go to classes, I'm just, I'm sitting there within the first two minutes, I know whether I'm gonna leave or not. And this before the class has even started. That's why I do it myself. <laughs> For, um, in this book, which I might reference a few times throughout this event, and for which there are lovely copies for sale at the back. Many copies. Many copies. <laughs> Signed copies. Not yet, but they will be. They will be. <laughs> you buy them. Um, there's, there's beautiful images um, of Scotland and the landscape, and you talk a little bit about um, the experience of growing up and, and hiking and walking through hills and mountains in Scotland and how that's informed your sense of place. And I wonder how that then played out uh, for your own yoga practice, that kind of mindful existence in nature. We'll clarify a few points. Am I points. being too existentialist? We will clarify a few <laughs> points first. So, obviously, I mean, most of you are from Scotland, correct? Yeah. You know that doing things outside is somewhat unpredictable. So those of you thinking, I've got my Kilted Yoga book, let's go to the garden. That probably won't work every day, so feel free to do any of it indoors. It will work just as well. Uh, maybe the outdoor walking meditation won't, maybe do that one outside walking. The, I've had some grief about the book, people saying I was playing off of the video. Why not, right? Got to pay those bills. Uh, but. The book gave me an opportunity to tap into an audience of people who looked at yoga in a different way perhaps for the first time and to give them beginner classes that they can do at home to start a practice. And that for me was a way for me to get yoga out there, or at least what I do and the way that I like to work out there to people who would never have done it before. So that's what it's for. The, the Scottish wildlife that is there and the landscapes are a framing device for what is still a, a legitimate practice. So you don't need to worry necessarily about finding the perfect waterfall for your Instagram handstand photo. You'll be fine. Um, but if you do, do a hashtag kilted yoga and <laughs> I'll comment, all right? So just remember that hashtag kilted yoga. It's in there, don't worry in case you missed that. But when, as you go through, I'm trying to remember where I was going with this. It's about the framing of the... Ah, so yeah, growing up in Scotland. I'm just going to make a clarification that being taken outside in Scotland as a youth wasn't necessarily voluntary. Um, <laughs> four brothers in a household. My mother basically kicked us out of the house and just was like, enough, I've had a week of you, go away. And so we were dragged up every mountain to tire us out for the, the rest of the time. Now those of you that are parents here, it's a very good, way, good thing to do. Drag them up the hills, no childhood obesity in my family. So with that, we were taken all over Scotland, but it, even when we were outside, I mean, my father, who was a, you know, a fan of a stiff backhanded slap, would make sure that we were quiet enough and reverent enough to still see a lot of the nature that was there. So, you know, we're not, like, the sort of boyish play that was there had to be somewhat subdued to bring in an appreciation for nature, and that was brought in at a young age. Even the colours that we wore had to be subdued enough that we didn't stand out. And in that, I mean, I grew up in, right on the very edge of Lanark, right where Lanark becomes New Lanark, so we were, from the front door, it was fields, nature reserve, world heritage site, so, it's very much what I grew up with. And then when I went to university, I was studying environmental science and classical archaeology at St Andrews, and it became a big part of what I did. And I moved into Scottish environmental conservation as part of my master's. And so like, that's always been a big part of what I do. So then having the opportunity to showcase locations, when I filmed the first Kilted Yoga video, I wanted to find somewhere that showed 
quite a few different snapshots of like the Scottish environment. So we had woodland, we had waterfall, we had open hillside, we had river, we had rock, and that was um, plus we had some of the heritage monuments in the heritage in Perthshire, and that gave me the opportunity to show that. And so that it's been really great to be able to showcase lots of places that I went as a child to all these audiences, but also it was very similar to like, that part of the valley where it's very similar to the Clyde Valley waterfalls. Mm -hmm. So it was yeah, just like home. Just a classic tropical image of European waterfalls as well, isn't it? I wouldn't go tropical. <laughs> <laughs> it was brisk, Try not to look cold, the person filming said. <laughs> February in Perthshire. <laughs> <laughs> generous in sharing um, a range of experiences you've been through and I want to talk a little bit about that and what yoga has on the, one, on the one hand offered you in terms of well-being and mental health um, but also how it really exposed you into this other world um, that we're going to get to but tell us a little bit about that um, mental health is something that's been um, experienced in your family in quite acute mm -hmm. ways and tell me how yoga is played. Sure, there's quite a big there's quite a big piece to unravel here. I think the the way I portray on social media I like to portray like an open book. I will write quite a bit on a daily basis. But it is almost to combat the perfectionism that is seen on there. I mean you've all seen the magazines where everything looks perfect and is photoshopped to perfection, but then the yoga world online shows one of bliss, serenity, perfection, perfect bodies, perfect clothes, perfect meal plans, um, and of these seemingly blissful lives, but that's so not how I'm also not what I've had. If other people have that, it's lovely for them. But I have an audience of people that appreciate that if I'm having a bad day, I will mention what it is. I, allow, I think it allows people to soften into their own humanity rather than thinking that their humanity is the problem with them. And so being able to speak about that has been quite powerful as well as opened a whole door to the sort of the toxic side of social media. So on um, so for example, like the last social media sharing that I did, I do a lot of meditation and journaling around memory retrieval. And a lot of the, what came up over the years was a lot of gaps in my childhood knowledge. And through processing the compulsion that I had around alcohol and the compulsion I had around the control of food and eating, I had to go back and figure out what caused that, what was the seed, what was the root. And out of that came a lot of darkness. But in order to process that, in order to move that forward, it had to be verbalized. And so I use my social media almost as a platform, not to intentionally make people uncomfortable, as some of you are right now, but to allow people to see that there is, that the silence has to stop and that actually silence has been crippling so many people for so long. I mean, look at the recent Me Too movement that has been so widespread but actually also become something that has to be spoken about from the men as well because they have their own Me Too stories. And in that huge eruption, they were forgotten, but they are now coming forward. And so there's been a huge movement in that direction. That's something I'm happy to be part of as well. So the social media world opens you up to that and in that way makes you intensely vulnerable. And when people, some people, when they see that, hopefully none of you are here, attack. And social media creates these keyboard warriors that go on the offensive for no reason other than, I assume, to spout their own toxic beliefs. So you've been, you've been quite open on social media and also open sort of all sorts of threads of conversations that are, as you say, uncomfortable. And when you say attack, that's been virtual online, but also you've been um, under threat. You've had mm -hmm. death threats, your home's been attacked for the simple reason of you allowing yourself to be you. Mm -hmm. 
Just I've had shocking letters, and... like hands in letters, left at my front door, threatening myself, my safety, but also even saying that they would attack my rescue dog. Um, so having to put, install a cage on your letterbox to make sure nobody puts chocolate through the front door to try and kill your dog is not a nice way to live. And what is worse is when police Scotland do nothing about it. So we, you know, we live in a democratic country. There's rule of law. You know, the majority live of people live in the illusion that we are equal. But, but yet, um, you find yourself at the front edge of this quite ugly stuff. Um, Tell us about what, what what's coming out of that, because it's quite a vulnerable position to be to become the face or the voice of something being thrust in that position all of a sudden. It is, but I've always been quite outspoken. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think this is this is like trying to lighten the mood somewhat. Even at my own christening, at the tender age of four, I shouted at the minister that he got my name wrong. That's fair enough, Peter. So like a full-on <laughs> diva moment at the age of four. They knew where that was going, so much for it being nurture. And with that, when these sort of things happen, I get the, a lot of people in my community say, oh, ignore it, ignore it, don't speak about it, keep it quiet. But if you don't speak about it and you keep it quiet, you perpetuate the silence and everybody thinks everything's fine. And that isn't okay. The number of people that have spoken to me, even in the street, saying I didn't think things like this happened anymore, and it's this great illusion that just because people don't notice it happening, we assume it's over. And it certainly is not. Mm. And even when I was going through my divorce, I was trying to avoid getting over the divorce, but here we are. We're at, we're at the divorce. Buckle in. Let's get it in. Let's get it out of the way. Get it out of the way. <laughs> just like I got it out of the way. Who has one of those stories anyway? Um, when I sat down about divorce, so I, if you've not worked it out yet, same-sex marriage. Okay, we've crossed that line. Great. Okay. So, don't leave. If you leave, it'll be very obvious that you're really intolerant. <laughs> and we will publicly shame you. <laughs> like, what's that, Barbara? Is me leaving? <laughs> so, with that, when I sat down in front of my lawyer after unveiling multiple counts of adultery, I was told that there was no legislation for same-sex couples to divorce on the basis of adultery, because adultery is between a man and a woman. And I couldn't get divorced. Legally, I had no protections. I lost my home. I lost my pets. I lost everything because there was no legal sanctions. So the the statement of equality. Everybody was super jazzed about getting the marriage thing, but they didn't think about changing the legislation on divorce. We want same sex divorce, damn it! <laughs> <laughs> but it just stands there. Are lots of these oversights that people may not necessarily consider and think. Oh, but you've got same-sex marriage now, everything must be okay. It's not. The incidence of abuse against people in the LGBT plus community is much higher than any other community. Mm -hmm. Much higher. Um, with, with I've the, derailed the conversation. Yeah, no, I mean, it's an important <laughs> conversation to have. I think, as you say, we make assumptions of where things are at right now. We have gay marriage, we have the rule of law, we have um, but, well, to bring it back in a tie in a different, however, but to tie in in a different way, it perpetuates this idea that of silence and presentation. I mean, certainly growing up, my parents' main drive was what will everyone else think, and so we were told to act and present and be quiet in a way that our emotions were subdued. And that's very rife in Scottish culture. And both my twin brother and I, my twin brother is painfully straight. Um, and well, you know, you've met him. Um, it's painfully straight, yet when we both produced a video on mental health, our conversation wasn't based on LGBT issues. It wasn't based on that. It was based on silence. And it was based on silence being a force that drove both of us within a year of one another to attempt suicide. And we wanted to break that. Even recently, in the last few weeks, I lost a friend to suicide. Another man. And the statistics for male mental health are frightening. So, I mean, maybe you'll know the detail, but um, for men between the ages of, between their 30s and 40s, is it, or late 20s in Western Europe, the number one cause of death 
is indeed suicide. And coming back yeah. to your point, people in the room might be more enlightened or have better data around this, but it's frankly shocking and a scandal that um, it's not being spoken about. So coming back to this idea of silence, you know, and the assumptions we make about the state of the world or the mechanisms of um, acceptance and inclusion, what is it from your own experience, from becoming also your own personal experience of going through all those really traumatic events early on in your life, but also later on with death threats and you know the whole stuff about the legal outcomes of the divorce? So your own experience, but also becoming the voice and the point of interaction for a range of these issues. What would you say to people that um, what is the one thing we can all do? To Break continue. your fixation with the word busy. So all too often when I speak to people, well, why were you yoga? I was too busy. How, why did you miss your journaling session? Have you been to see your therapist? I was too busy. And this fascination with busy becomes an excuse not to do the work. And the work is introspection. The work is meditation. The work is being able to sit with yourself and appreciate yourself and to move into that realm of acceptance. And this is where the yoga philosophy can become quite, well, I say helpful, can become quite unique because that certainly isn't what we're raised with. We're um, certainly in my own upbringing, apologies in advance, Church of Scotland, I wasn't raised to care for myself. I wasn't raised to appreciate myself, take pride in my actions. And I certainly wasn't raised to love myself. I was raised to know that I was imperfect, that I was a sinner, and I was going to go to hell regardless. And that was difficult. So to have a yoga practice where I'm asked to meet myself on my mat, right there, be fully engaged with myself in that moment, and to be able to be okay with where I'm at, to practice acceptance, even practicing acceptance of, okay, this is how this yoga pose is right now, is still teaching acceptance, gratitude, and being present as a practice. And that is something that's incredibly helpful. And this is why mindfulness, the buzzword for curriculum for excellence at the minute, is getting sort of pandered into a lot of schools. But in essence, the yogis had it right a long time ago. A long, long time ago. At least the philosophy part. So that is where even if you pick up the book simply to look at the breathing exercises or the walking meditation. You do not need to be an advanced practitioner. You do not need to be mobile. You do not need to even sit outside. You can do it. You can sit and take a conscious breath. It's easy. Well, that bit's easy. <laughs> Taking your breath is easy. The other bits. Hmm. On work note, on that. I wonder if this is a good time to for all of us to come together. Mm -hmm. Sure. First off, those of you who are sitting like this, <laughs> sit up. I'm going to try something. <laughs> <laughs> sit up a little. Relax your arms. Those of you clutching your book, I will sign it, don't you worry. You can put it down for now. 